This dates back to the Egyptians. It, it says using a mirror, like the American Indians, you use a mirror to, to communicate. Try to send Morse code this way. The, the guy on the right has got, the, he's flashing to the next guy down the line, and the guy on the left with the telescope, he's picking up n another station like that. Not a particularly effective way, and the sun has to be out for that. Well, how do you fix that? They had what they call a daylight lamp. This was when the sun wasn't out. They had a very intense lamp, shuttered like the, the Navy used to use to, uh, to talk between ships. The only problem with this one was that you were a heck of a target because the enemy could see this as well as your own people. Very risky thing to do. What else did they have? And the telephone. Now, the telephone was in common use in the civilian world by this time. And it took a little while, but eventually, once the front stabilized, they used telephones to communicate to the front lines, which worked fine, except when anybody tried to move, they had to carry a spool of wire with them. But even worse, it was heavy shell fire, heavy artillery fire, and it would cut the wires. So the, it's as if you didn't have communications at all, because the, uh, uh, once the wires were cut, there was no way to, uh, to, to repair them. If people tried, and again, that was a pretty risky occupation as well. This is my favorite. <clears throat> they went back to carrier pigeons. And very extensively, the British had 90,000 men in the first war devoted to the care and feeding and, and operating of carrier pigeon communications. Uh, it, uh, it, it works the way you think it does. You, you tie a message to the, to the leg of a, of a pigeon and send him off and he goes back to the loft. He's a homing pigeon, goes back to the loft. Somebody retrieves the pigeon, opens up the message and tries to get it to the right person. Um, and it was pretty effective uh, until you ran out of pigeons. But the reason I like this picture is, what is that fellow doing? He's in a tank. The tank was, was originally designed in the First World War, 1916, by Churchill, uh, who was the, the main reason that they built it. And uh, here he is, here's the fellow in the most high-tech weapon system of the day, the tank, and using a carrier pigeon to communicate. And uh, that's how primitive the communication systems were. Now, did they have wireless? They did. They had wireless. The wireless was spark telegraphy. Uh, used a spark gap to communicate, and uh, was uh, and they weren't sending voice uh, because you can't communicate using sparks. Uh, communicate by voice by using sparks. Um, it was all telegraphy, so the, the people had to know Morse code. And, uh, <clears throat> but that was the worst part of it. The worst part of it was the fact that this set he's sitting at, that weighed about 50 pounds. That part, <clears throat> the batteries for it weighed another 100. So in order for this to be any way portable, you had to have three men to carry it. And if you wanted to carry it forward with the troops, uh, they, these are three people heavily burdened trying to get through a uh, a, a very, very dangerous area, and it wasn't used very much. So that, that was pretty awkward, but possibly you could live with it. It had a worse problem, though. And I'll get into that. Uh, why sparks? Now, the history of uh, communication started with, with uh, James Clark Maxwell, who predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves in 1873, and Heinrich Hertz. Uh, he confirmed that, confirmed they existed by using, using a generated sparks between two conducting hemispheres and detecting the sparks by a, by a loop, a little loop antenna, although we didn't call it that. So he, he determined, Hertz determined experimentally that the electromagnetic waves predicted by Maxwell uh, did exist. Mr. Marconi, Guglielmo Marconi, was a young Italian who was not a, a trained engineer, not uh, technical really at all. He learned, he, he worked with an prof engineering professor at, in Italy and he learned a little bit. But he was a very, very practical person, and he, he had the vision that 
that these could be used as a communication system. The Spark communication could be used, or the Spark system could be used as a communication system. And uh, he just uh, cut and tried, cut and tried, uh, in the classic manner that we do today as engineers. And he finally figured out you had to have something called an antenna, namely a long wire that would radiate these, uh, these spark waves. And how do you detect them? He had something called a, a coherer, which is a glass tube full of iron filings that would become conductive in the presence of an electromagnetic field. These two items, the antenna, the spark system, of course, and the detector, was the dominant communication system in the world for 30 years, from 1890 to 1920. Uh, Marconi built a, a, a great business uh, with it. Uh, he had demonstrated it to the British Post Office and they backed him. And then the British Navy took a tremendous interest in it because they had no way of communicating with ships before he came around. And they had a visionary as a very senior British officer who recognized it and pushed, pushed the system. So the commercial world needed a way of keeping track of their ships and, and Marconi provided it. Uh, the famous uh, message from the Titanic that it was going down uh, that was received in New York uh, that was from a Spark wireless set. So it was a dominant communication system, point-to-point -point communication system in the world for 30 years. <clears throat> Actually, people did experiment with these once Marconi uh, put it together or made it seem that you could do that and uh, and I found uh, in one of uh, my, the articles I was reading a actually radio amateur set <laughs> the telegraph key battery and induction coil like you had in a car and uh, that would generate a spark cap when the currents through the coil were interrupted put a condenser in it and then into uh, an aerial and that would produce a spark you couldn't communicate with it you had to have some sort of buzzer system to to send Morse code with it, but th that would work. And uh, the, the the commercial systems and the like didn't do much more than just that. It had a condenser, it had a coil, and, and it had a way of generating sparks. <clears throat> 1914, getting back to the British, they did have wireless telegraphy using the Morse code, no voice. They had spark transmitters, which are very, very inefficient. It takes a lot of power to put a spark communications or spark system on the air. And uh, as I mentioned before, the field wireless set weighed a minimum of 150 pounds and they used lead acid batteries. And uh, they usually didn't try to carry it. They transported it by horse, truck, or, or motorcycle. But they did use it. They didn't use many of them for one reason, interference. A spark system interrupts a, a transmitter, essentially sends a buzz, a buzz sound, and it radiates what's called a damp sine wave. And the damp sine wave can be shown experimentally and, and theoretically to contain frequencies that are uh, <clears throat> entirely uh, you know, beyond the, the, the normal frequency that you have in a radio. And, uh, the sets interfere with each other. And I had, I don't know if this is going to work. I'll give it a try. There we go. That's what a spark system sounded like. And that was three, that was three separate transmitters. You'd have to be able to distinguish them. And, uh, and uh, because they're interfering with each other. Yes, you have a question? I just have a question. If you, all, all this had been going on, um, and there was no <coughs> communication, I know this sounds a silly question. When was the Morse code actually invented? Oh, it invented in 1945 or so. 1845. The original telegraph. Yeah. Oh, 18, so 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, yeah. yeah. How was that taken up then? By the... Oh, that's what they used. That was, that's, it was Morse communication with the telegraph. Oh, right. so there no, were, I didn't know that. Yeah, there okay. was an interrupt. Yeah. You could use a buzzer, like a door buzzer. Yeah. And, and that's what it sounded like, oh, what no. I just played. Okay. okay. So, so I'll, I'll do it again as long as it works. I'm glad it does. <laughs> 
This is one. This is two. This is three. So, spark communication systems in close proximity interfere with each other. And this fact is the reason that we don't have them around today. They are outlawed in the 1920s by, by international agreement because they interfere with everything. And they were, it did severely limit their use uh, from a practical standpoint, from the Army point of view. You couldn't locate these uh, spark uh, systems within less than 3,000 yards of each other, which in World War I meant one per division, one per 12,000 men. Not a very handy communication system for tactical communication. That's why Spark Wireless really never, despite its portability, despite its freedom from wires, and despite its promise, never was effective in the First World War because of the interference, because you couldn't move them easily. Oh, I meant to change the slide. Okay. Um, so it does limit the number of uh, communication channels you can have. Now, how do you how do you beat it? Well, we all know that you use a continuous wave, which uses a single frequency to communicate on, uh, like uh, AM radio or FM radio. And it's called a carrier frequency, and it's it's uh, uh, just as it's used in today's radio. Now, this fact was actually known to radio engineers in 1914. They knew that there was a better system than the spark system. But the problem was, how do you get a reliable source of continuous wave? How do you get an oscillator? Well, Howard Armstrong invented the oscillator in 1912, and it was pretty well known to engineers. What you needed was a vacuum tube. The vacuum tube was originally, uh, by that I mean the triode, was originally uh, uh, invented and patented by a fellow named Lee de Flores. He didn't really know what it was good for until Armstrong came along and Armstrong uh, realized that it was a, a potentially a, a source of, uh, first of all, a regenerative, a, an amplifier, and it could be used as an oscillator, and uh, it could also be used as a modulator. So all of these things could be done by a vacuum tube. And they did have vacuum tubes. It wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't a, just a laboratory gadget. By 1916, they used vacuum tubes fairly extensively uh, by the British intelligence. They, uh, they monitored the German Navy's radio communications and had to have very sensitive amplifiers to do it because they were some distance away from Germany. And between, uh, <coughs> with, a, with a multiple stations where they could determine the direction of arrival of the incoming wave, they could actually locate German ships uh, on the ocean uh, by triangulation. So there were vacuum tubes available, and they were starting to come into commercial use. Not many, but, but they were in mass production. So vacuum tubes were available in 1916. Now knowing this, again, I asked the question, how come? If you got vacuum tubes, you got the oscillator, you got the amplifier, why wasn't it used? Well, it was. And this is the sad story. Wireless is the only way to communicate with an aircraft. Uh, many ways were tried. They would put panels on the ground. The pilot would look at the panel and figure out what was trying to be said. And, uh, and he would wave or somehow communicate back to the, to the troops. Eventually, they, they did put a, a, a radio telegraph into an aircraft. Uh, to help them 